uh, record button. So from here on, we're being recorded. Um, I just ask if this is being sorry. recorded after the session, would it be able to be sent to us as well? Yeah, yeah. Usually what I do is after every workshop, after the second, because I usually run these workshops twice, after the second workshop, I usually uh, look at both of the recordings and usually I, I might send both or the best one or maybe but just I'll send both to everyone who participated because I, I do have all your emails. Yeah, that would be uh, and I can tell you, if you want to pull up the page right now, Elena, I think that was Elena that asked the question. Um, and this is good for everyone to know. If you just Google FIT Teach Remotely, you'll see a link to all of our workshops. And you will see the recorded lecture there as well as all the recorded lectures that we've done this summer. So, oh, wow. Okay, great. Not, Thank I shouldn't you. say lectures, I should say workshops or sessions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, and also another plug is we also some of these videos. If you can't find them at the website, the Teach Remotely website, we also have our YouTube channel, which we try to put also those same yeah. videos on, the, on our YouTube channel so that we can find them. Uh, subscribe to our subscribe to our YouTube channel. <laughs> so yes. Our online learning uh, FIT YouTube channel. Yes. Um, it's great to have everyone here. I've, I'm always excited. Uh, to see so many people and also when we're doing workshops uh, during the summer, um, seeing all the familiar faces and new faces. So this is great. Um, one quick announcement that I just found out this morning, uh, for those of you who are using Screencast-O-Matic, since this is a flip the classroom workshop, uh, there was a new announcement. Uh, the the Screencast-O-Matic uh, app now uh, has been up, upgraded. And so if you do have Screencast-O-Matic installed on your phone, it can now, uh, uh, for those people who are doing demonstration videos or studio uh, videos, it's the uh, Screencast-O-Matic mobile app can now uh, record uh, talking heads, video demonstrations, and also screen captures, which is, I was so happy to, I was waiting for this upgrade to happen. And so that's now ready if you are uh, looking to use uh, Screencast-O-Matic in your class to create those flipped classroom uh, videos. If you do install the Screencast-O-Matic mobile app to your phone, uh, you can do uh, a lot more now um, with the app installed on your phone. Awesome. Yes, I was happy to hear that this morning. Um, all right, so so um, let me share my screen. I have some slides for you all. And um, I'll, I'll put the link to those slides. So if, if you do want to follow along with the slides, you can click on this link. Uh, here we go. Let me go into the chat and I'll post a link to those slides in the in the chat. So if you click on that link, it should take you to my slides. Let me make sure that works. Yeah, that's working. Great. And feel free to uh, make a copy of the slides if you want them or just to have them as reference if you want to go back. Um, I try to keep my slides very simple, so you'll, you probably will only see titles or images in there. So, uh, but if you if you want to use them, and at the bottom I do have a slide on resources with links, so uh, that might be the most valuable uh, slide there if, if it's your, you're looking for links to these resources. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. And I hope everyone's able to see my slides. Let's take a look. Okay, here we go. All right. Is everyone able to see my my screen? Yes. yes. Oh, perfect. All right. So, so uh, like Tammy uh, uh, mentioned. Oh, really? Why? Uh, why can't? Oh, there I can see. Oh, you can see. Perfect, Yelena. Awesome. So, just like Tammy mentioned, the flip classroom uh, is a technique that we have, uh, have adopted is nothing new. Uh, Flip Classroom has been around for several years, has been tested, and there's uh, 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 data suggesting it works. So this is something that's proven. There's nothing new. Uh, and basically what the Flip Classroom is, in a nutshell, uh, uh, basically uh, it, it is students watching your lecture videos on their own time, right? So by on your on your own time, I'm referring to students at home or on the on the bus ride home or the train ride they can turn on their smartphone uh, put on your video they can watch it and and then you know what do the assignment that you have attached to that video on their own time 
And what that what this does is it frees up time in the physical classroom, in the face-to-face -face classroom, for you to then do much more interactive things with the classroom. Uh, you can, and this is the analogy I use uh, a lot, is uh, a, a baseball coach showing uh, the players of the team the fundamentals of the fundamentals of baseball, teaching them, you know, okay, this is how you throw the ball, this is how you catch the ball, this is how you run the bases, and all of this is recorded on video, so that students can then go watch, rewind, fast forward, slow down, read the captions on their own time. And then this time that's freed up in the physical classroom can then be focused on students who are struggling with certain problems so that you can give more one-on-one -on -one time to students who are struggling. Uh, not only that, it's also uh, frees up a lot of time for you to do much more interactive discussions, uh, activities within the classroom that uh, uh, creates more of an active learning in, within the classroom as opposed to lecturing away for two hours while students are passively listening to your lecture. That's in a nutshell is what flipped classroom technique is about. And so in this presentation, I'm gonna show you uh, some activities and strategies that you can use in the physical classroom to um, make your class much more interactive. Uh, and so here's a, a visual, and by the way, feel free to jump in if you have a question. I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't wanna be the only one talking while presenting. As you all know, in, in my previous workshop, I always invite people to come in, in, and share their thoughts. And, and that's, I think that's the best way for us to learn as we share ideas. Here's a, here's a diagram of the flipped classroom model. Again, uh, before the class, the students uh, are doing their work, watching the videos, and very similar to how we assign homework. This is what happened before the classroom, right? Students prepare to participate in class activities. So that's very, very important, the before the classroom part where students are on their own time and doing the work, watching the video, and also the assignments that are attached to that video. Then during the class, this is where students practice applying the key concepts and feedback. This is what we're mostly gonna focus on today uh, in today's workshop is what, you know, what are some strategies, activities that we can do during the class time. And, and also after the class, students check their understanding and extend their learning. So it's a continuous flow that goes from left to right, uh, you know, going from the before, bridging the before to then during the class. And this, we're going to talk about bridging the on your own time to bri bridging that to then what, what you will do during the class. And we'll talk about that in a second. And so uh, the first day of class is very important because for the flipped classroom model, you really have to explain to your students what are the rules of the game, right? And so the first day, you should really go into detail as how are you gonna manage the flipped classroom model and how are you gonna form, how are you gonna really use it in your in your class for your style of teaching? And so, so the student won't be surprised to know that, hey, if you don't come to class prepared and uh, prepared to add value to the conversation in the physical classroom, then you know they they're going to be <clears throat> they're going to be uh, 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 either you know uh, not able to participate and definitely you will take notice that students are not doing the work the on your own time work and not bringing that into the classroom that hey you might fail this class right so come on you got to do the work and this is something that we all as teachers we all face is you know what do I do when students are not doing the homework right so think of it as that way. It's nothing new, right? You're gonna have students who are not gonna do the homework, gonna to come to class, and they're gonna to try to get by without doing the work that is required of them. And so, you know, this is why it's, in, it's important the first day of class and on your syllabus to now participation becomes a key. You know, when students go through your course, they go straight to the syllabus and they're gonna go look at, okay, how is the grade breakdown? You know, if I had a, for marketers, if I had the um, hotspot, you know, where the students go on the syllabus, you'll see that big red circle right next to the, break, the grade breakdown. 
right? Because as the first thing they look at is, okay, how can I pass this class, and what do I have to do to survive and make, you know, and get this, you know, B or whatever that I'm trying to get, and so they go to the grade breakdown. And so now, now that you know that, you want to you want to hold students accountable, and we're going to talk about accountability more in a second, but you know if you're going to hold students accountable for the work that has to be done on your own time, you have to attach grades or a, uh, uh, points or grades to uh, that homework, right? So if, if you're going to have students watch your videos, you want to make sure that they're watching it, uh, you, might, uh, you might make those videos interactive with questions, or you might attach a quiz to that video to make sure that students are watching the video, or what we're going to talk about in a second is we're going to talk about how to bridge the uh, uh, on your own time to then to the physical classroom, which then you'll know which students are, are actually watching the videos. And so uh, on your own time basically means the work that students are doing outside of the, uh, outside of the classroom. So that's what I mean by on your own time. Uh, this is the work that you're assigning to your students. You know, um, we all, you know, we we at the online learning department, we mostly deal with students who are taking classes online, right? And so, these students are people who have part-time jobs, who are parents, and so for them, the schedule is crucial. So they're on a time schedule, and they have to, you know, do the work on while on the commute to work, or you know, they always always got to find a place to be able to do that work. And so that's what we're referring to on your own time. And so the class time uh, is, 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 so if you want to bridge now that work that students were supposed to do on your own time uh, and bridge that over to the physical class and when they do come to class, uh, you, you don't want to just forget about the assigned work. Right? You don't want to say, okay, well, okay, I, I assigned them this work and never go back and talk about it in the classroom. It's so important to then say, okay, well, this is what we, 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 this is what the video was about, right? And now as we come back into the classroom, let's talk about what were the, you know, what did you learn? What were the, some muddiest points about that lecture that we just watched on your own time? You know, what was difficult for you to understand? And you carry that over into the physical classroom, right? You don't just forget about it. You continue the conversation in the classroom. And so that's what I'm referring to as bridging the on your own work, on your own, you know, on your own time to then in the class time. And so that's, that's, that's important for you to do that. And so the assignments that, or activities that you do that we're going to talk about today in the classroom can then enforce that, you know, bridging that, uh, 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 that learning, right? So you're bridging that, 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 that video that they just watched and then the assignment that you had them do, you can carry that over into the class. So for example, if you have them watch a video about the Vietnam War and then you, let's say you create an assignment or a Padlet for them to then uh, post images of the war and talk about their opinion about the war in, in, on your own time, then on the physical class when they come back, you have these uh, this material now that you can actually call on students uh, to then talk about it and continue the conversation in the classroom. All right, and so we're going to talk about some of those activities and strategies in a moment, and that's what I meant by bridging the two together. And so we, now we talk about accountability, just like we meant, just like how I use the example of a homework. Right, uh, students don't do the homework. Uh, that could be the straw. That, or the, the car that would knock down the whole house of cards if the students don't come prepared to the classroom, right? So you gotta really hold them accountable. And, and by holding them accountable is by attaching a grade to some of these homework assignments that are attached to the video that they're gonna watch on their own time, right? And so, uh, and, and you'll know when you're doing these activities in the classroom, uh, who is doing, who is watching the video and who's doing the work, obviously because you want students to add value to the conversation in the physical classroom. And, and so, you know, you might get students who are trying to talk their way out, you know, talk their way through, uh, you know, through the, the classroom discussions. And so you always got to keep a close eye on those students uh, and see who's doing the work, who's not, and, and really uh, uh, targeting students who are struggling and holding them accountable or giving them more one-on-one -on -one time now that you freed up a lot of the class time. 
Jose, can I can I just jump in here? It's Naomi. Um, one Don't of the it. things that I learned last semester, which I did not know, was um, in the grade book, there's an option, and some other some people in this call may know this. I did not know this. Um, there's an option in the grade book for complete and incomplete as opposed yeah. to assigning an actual grade. So my plan for this fall, because I'm teaching a blended course, which by nature of what it is, is a flipped class, um, is to have the students submit what they would normally be doing in class using the video tutorials into a Dropbox where they'll simply just get a complete or incomplete for that particular in-class exercise that they've done on their right. own, and then we can pick up from there in the classroom. Yeah, and again, that's a great a great example of, of doing these formative assessments that are quick to grade, right? Just a complete or incomplete, where you don't have to really go into and 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 really uh, and you know go through the grading of you know 19 students or 20, you know, however many students that will eat up a lot of your time for these formative assessments. That's a great example, uh, Naomi. Thanks for sharing. And, and anyone else has any other uh, examples of this type of uh, <clears throat> uh, assessments as your students are doing this work on their own time? Well, I can just um, add my experience um, teaching social media at Northeastern University. Um, you know, I was wondering how to show them everything they need to know and then have them work. This is when social media was really new. So, you know, they'd have to learn about all of these social media tools and then be practical and be using them. So I ended up embracing flipped classroom, and this was many years ago, but um, they would watch the video tours of LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, as I would orient them, and then they would come to class having watched them, and again, it's about accountability. If they hadn't watched them, they would be totally lost because I was expecting them to create accounts in class, to play around on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and um, other tools. So I think that's just you know another example of how they are expected to come to class prepared, and it's a really good way to motivate them, I think, right? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm happy you mentioned uh, LinkedIn Learning and YouTube because um, we often forget that at FIT we have the uh, the school pays for the LinkedIn uh, Pro accounts. So if you're not looking to reinvent the wheel and you don't want to have to you know make your own videos, you can always find really great videos in LinkedIn Learning or on YouTube and then use those videos for students to watch on your own time. So we often forget about that. I'm glad Tammy mentioned. Uh, uh, LinkedIn learning. Um, so b before I jump into some examples, um, I, I want to, you know, I, since this is our second time running this workshop, I, you know, I, uh, on our first workshop, Patricia uh, gave us some, a great example, and I, I now that I'm doing it a second time, I said, hey, well, maybe I spend a little more time on that. Uh, we were talking about uh, the icebreaker and student profiles. And sometimes, you know, we often look as the, as, at the icebreaker as a, um, a, a fun activity that really doesn't garner much, uh, you know, uh, relevance or doesn't produce much data for you. But looking at it carefully, you know, for the past few years as I'm, you know, uh, I've been working here at FIT, I, I, I really, you know, realized that the, the icebreaker is such a, could be such an important tool for you as a teacher uh, because uh, you can uh, gather so much information about your students and gathering that that information and converting that into your student profiles so that yet from from the student profiles that data you collect from your students uh, I, I think Naomi I think you do this with your icebreaker using a Padlet where you have your students you know upload their image uh, their photo uh, a little bit about themselves yeah I know Lucy, Right, you do that, right? And so, and Lucy Jensen, who I work with a lot, she she has a survey, you know, that she has her students fill out, like 19 questions. And so, these questions can be, uh, uh, you know, added to a Google form or a Padlet. Um, uh, and then what you do is with a Padlet, then you convert that into a PDF, and then you have a, a PDF of your student profiles. And and the only reason why I mentioned student profiles because from the student profiles you'll get some great lesson hooks you know 
um, uh, based on what your students, who they are, uh, where they come from. Um, the Japanese, um, they do, they have something called kintsugi, kintsugi technique. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, let me see if I can spell it, kintsugi technique, which basically is um, uh, when they have uh, teapots that have cracks. You know, here at the West, we were like, oh, you know, my teapot broke, let me just throw it away and buy a new one. But they see the beauty in those cracks, right, uh, from hundreds and two hundreds and three hundreds of years. And so if you look for those cracks or these uh, 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 imperfections in your students that can lead to then new lesson plans, new lesson hooks, uh, and then you can pull those, find those cracks using these icebreakers and then creating student profiles that will give you ideas for then when you do these activities in the classroom, now you can, um, you can really um, uh, modify these activities to match your students uh, based on their student profiles, if that makes any sense. You know what I do, Jose, also? Mm -hmm. Because I'm, you know, we're visual in, the, in our area. I have them yeah. in the icebreaker uh, create a collage. I, I ask, most of them know Photoshop. Uh, and I say, if you don't know Photoshop, you can do it in, in uh, PowerPoint or Google Slides, save it as a PDF. And I, and they, uh, I tell, uh, you know, I, I, I give them my collage picture of myself and the hobby. So, I mean, you can do that in Padlet, of course. Right. And I like that because I get to see the ones that traveled, they, they show where they came from, whatever. I tell them whatever images that you want that really you can, sh that you are comfortable sharing with your classmates. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so much fun to hear them talking to each other. Oh, I come from the same area. Or, oh, I went to that mm -hmm. school. Or, mm -hmm. so it's, yeah, that's a great yeah, point, Joanne, you know, and, and creating that space. I do some huh? some of the same is that I have I have my, it's a public speaking course and I have them oh. um, uh, prepare a collage. But first they have to do these self image forms on how do they see themselves intellectually, okay. emotionally, da, 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 da. and then it becomes a formal speech using their own collages. And I oh, had one cool. girl who was so desperately shy um that she really did have anxiety apprehension and uh she, oh, yeah. she really couldn't couldn't share uh but she could share with this collage images she made yeah, this I'll gigantic shoe because that was her major so it was a beautiful right. black little um uh, kitten heel shoe and on that she put all of her memorabilia and uh so wow. she was able to talk to us through that which is yeah it's, it's a wonderful idea yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, that and what, it works for the shy people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what Patricia does, which I see in your course, Patricia, and what you do amazing what you do it's amazing to me how you make that safe place and you create a safe place for your students because the topics that do come up can be, you know, very personal and the anxiety of speaking in front of the class. So you know, I would say kudos to you for uh, you know, creating a safe space for students to then share uh, these stories with their classmates. Um, the, the first activity that I'm going to share with you all is called the snowball game. Oh, and Google Earth. Uh, Jose, Robert yeah. just wrote something about Google Earth. Wow. Oh, Google Earth. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I can't see the chat, but c can you tell me what she wrote? I'm sorry. Robert. I'll tell you, Jose. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've, we've had them stand up and use Google Earth to show their hometown and mm -hmm. kind of explain to the class why we should go visit there, what the high points are, what kind of food, what oh. restaurants. They have. And it gives them five or 10 minutes to just get used to speaking in front of the class and become a personality to the rest of the class. Mm -hmm. And oh, I used to do it, it in the middle of the course, but I do it now in the, in the first day. That's great. Um, I love this. That's, that's a great activity. And you know, it's funny. It's funny. Well, I don't, don't give me. I don't take uh, credit ahead. for it. I actually picked it up from Robert Vassilotti, so give him the credit. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure to mention that to Robert. But, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I'm a big basketball fan and I was following the USA Olympics and, you know, everyone's, we're all watching, I guess. And and uh, there was a, 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 a NBA player by the you know, his name is Damian uh, Lillard, Lillard. And he said, you know, you know uh, these basketball players that are from foreign countries uh, play better in the Olympics 
because they are um, representing their countries. And so when you have students talk about where they come from and the pride, uh, then some I, I can see why some of the anxiety and the fear might help help them, you know, uh, pr present in a, in a classroom who might be shy or talk, you know. So uh, that's always a I like that I like that activity. That's a good one. That's interesting. Um, so the first one is kind of similar to to that uh, idea, which it's it's about helping the students speak up in the classroom, right? And so the snowball game basically is for you know these sensitive topics uh, that you know that you know students might if you if you are having students talk about. Uh, sensitive topics, or 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 it might not be sensitive topics, and these students might be you know shy, and you might have a lot of shy students in your class, and and you want to kind of break the ice, and 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 so what the snowball game is about is you have your students write a paper, and oh, and, and I, for, I forgot to mention though before before I say this, uh, a lot of these activities and strategies that I'm going to talk about uh, are very are open to you to make them your own. So don't take, you know, if, you know, make sure that you can make them your own by taking them and changing things. They're not set in stone, so just feel free to change them in a way that fits your teaching style. Um, and so with the snowball game, what you do is the students are going to write a paper, right? It could be about anything. And then you, when they come into the class, and so they're writing the paper on your own time, right? This is outside the classroom. And then when they come into the classroom, they come prepared with the paper, right? And it's a physical paper now I'm talking about, like actual paper, they come into the class. And you have them form a circle in the classroom. And then you say to them, okay guys, pull out your paper. And again, remember, if they don't do, the, if they don't do that, that work, like we talked about accountability, they can't participate in the snowball game, so they're gonna feel left out. Um, you tell them to crumble the paper. So they might get shocked because they spent all this time and effort working on a paper. You're telling them to crumble the paper. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> and so you're going to see a little maybe faces of shock from your students. But then you say, go ahead, crumble that paper. And then you're going to tell them, we're going to have a snowball fight, right? And you're going to have them toss these uh, snowballs at each other. And uh, when, I, when, I, when I've seen the, I've seen it done in a couple of classrooms, it's, it turned into a fun game. You know, people are relaxed, they're enjoying themselves because you're making it into uh, a fun activity. And so the anxiety level drops, right? It's no longer like, oh my gosh, I have to speak in front of the classroom. What if I mumble? What if I stutter? What if I say the wrong thing? People are judging me, you know, what are they going to think about me? Uh, and so as you're playing the snowball fight, you know, students are throwing the, the snowballs at each other, then you tell your students now to pick a, uh, a snowball from the floor. Most likely you're going to be a random, uh, you know, it's not going to be your own paper, uh, you know, depending on how many students you have in your class too, that, that, that might make a difference. Uh, and so the idea of the game is now that you're having a students read the pa someone else's paper, and so uh, reducing the anxiety, reducing, you know, the, the fear of having to speak, you know, now you're talking for someone else on someone's behalf. And that can help, you know, students who aren't, uh, English is not their first language, it might be foreign students. It's a fun way to introduce students to speaking in front of the classroom. And it's a fun way to, to open up the class and say, hey, you know, we're, we're not here just about you know, I'm not here about just to, you know, embarrassing from the classroom. We're here to learn about each other and learn from each other. So that was the first one. Anyone, uh, anyone want to jump in on that and make any or any comments or suggestions about the snowball game? I do. Uh, hi, I'm Judy. I do something a little different. I teach in the computer graphics, so we're doing usually hands-on, but. What we did over the past couple of semesters is, and it's a little crazy sounding, is when we were on camera, everyone started bringing their favorite stuffed animal, believe it or not, mm -hmm. to show. Mm -hmm. And it gave them a lot of comfort because there's been mm -hmm. so much anxiety during this. And then the other thing we started to do was we would get to class a little early. We can't do this now in the labs, but we bring our favorite beverage of what we were drinking for the day. And everybody mm. would show different kinds of teacups, coffee cups, whatever, soda, whatever anybody was drinking. And we did that kind of sharing to 
get a different kind of conversation going because my students mm. come from all different majors because I'm a uh, an intro computer graphics class for Photoshop. So it was mm. it was a re it worked out really well. I love that. That's that's another way to uh, make associations and connections within students. Like, oh, you know, I that's that's also you know I remember that being my favorite drink or candy. Uh, you know, especially retro candy. I'm a big fan of the you know 80s and 90s candies. <laughs> but that's a great example. Any other example before we move on to number two? Jose, one thing I've done is um, I've had strangers kind of interview each other and then introduce each other and give them a ah. you know their, their hometown, their favorite food what rock group they like, just so that different students get to meet, because they tend to hang out in cliques. Um, and yes. that's a simple Robert, way also. Too, <clears throat> this is Patricia. I do that one too. And uh, what I, I had them do prior to that is choose somebody from the room who, for whatever reason, they think is, um, um, sorry about that, they think is their opposite. And, uh, oh. and then they slowly find out that they really aren't opposite. They've got so <laughs> much more commonality between each other, uh, um, yes. between them, you know, than, than opposite. Just yeah, I've used something similar to that. I've used the one that uh, th uh, I think it's called uh, three truths and one lie. And then you have students, you know, tell three, Ooh. you know, you, you tell them three truths about yourself. And then there's one lie in there. And then, and then students are then um, asked to comment on each other's and then try to figure out which one is the lie, you know. Uh, and so it's a fun game to get as an icebreaker yeah, too, yeah. As to, to get students to figure out what is that one lie. And uh, and most of the times the funny thing is that uh, one lie, what they think is a lie is not, you know, <laughs> and you know, they'll always pick some, the, the, the wildest thing that they've done as truths to throw people off. And that's always, you know, encouraging, encouraging the student to really, hey, you know, I, I, I flew a plane and I jumped out in a parachute, you know, and hey, I actually did that, you know, just to throw people off as a lie. Um, so that, that's, so that, that's a fun one to do. The, the second one that I want to jump to now is the think, pair, share. And this is great because as we talked about bridging the on your own work to then the physical classroom time, the what you can do now is once the students have done the work, the on your own work, um, pairing now when they come to the classroom, pairing these students just like, uh, I didn't get the person's name, but pairing students together like strangers that they don't know each other, pairing them together. Uh, and this is where to, this is where the student profiles can come in handy because you might be teaching several classes and it's hard for you to track all the students that you are teaching to and so having the student profile will help you then to pair these students together right and so if you, if you know that this student is is doing this major and then doing and this other student is doing a different major that'll be a good you know or this student's from this country and this student's you know that's where the student profile will help you pair these students and the think pair share is basically it's a collaborative learning strategy where students work together to solve a problem or answer a question about an assigned reading or a video lecture. And so that could be another way that you can, how we talked about bridging, right? And so if you group them into small groups or into pairs of two and then have them talk about the video lecture or, or the task or the big question that you had for them uh, and then have them talk in groups and then uh, as they're done talking, then you have maybe one person from the group representing the group and talk about um, what the group, uh, how the group came together. Um, a similar activity to the Think Pair Share is the peer assessment. And the peer assessment has been, you know, there, it's a very popular activity and I'm sure most of you have used it, but it's a way for students to exchange feedback, critical thinking or, or critique um, uh, offer critique to their fellow classmates of their work. And, you know, um, when we do offer peer assessments in our classrooms, sometimes what I've seen when I'm certifying classes, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of the times where students are, are just saying, well, you know, I agree with Tom, I agree with Annie, because many of the times students are afraid to critique, right, to offer feedback to other students without offending them. So 
you know, a lot of these students have never been asked to critique other people's work, and so they're not trained to do so. And so what I say to faculty when I'm reviewing their courses is that offer the students or train them, you know, offer them a rubric <laughs> or the criteria for them to know how to critique other students' work. And so, for example, something like, you know, you can offer three modes of criteria. You can say to them, what did you learn from your classmate? What would you do differently? And what advice would you offer to your fellow classmates, right? So you can come up with your own criteria so that the students are not lost on trying to critique their fellow classmates. And then you'll get much more valuable feedback from students as they're critiquing their classmates. Any, any other one, anybody else want to jump in on this one? I know Patricia, you, you had a great example on our last workshop. Any, any comments about peer assessments, anyone? I'm so sorry. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Jose, my, my mic was off. Um, oh, no worries. I, I don't know wh which one I had discussed the last time, but what came to mind when you were just saying that is that their first um, uh, speech that they do um, is a freebie. They're not graded on it. They are, um, I, I give them lecture on how to do a formal speech, the introduction, the body, conclusion, and those elements. And then when they critique, that is the, uh, those are the uh, assessment criteria, is that, well, how did they handle the parts of a good introduction? Did they have this? Okay, so next time we, we want, we loved this, but we'd like to see a little bit more of this, so that they first mm -hmm. start with something positive of what worked, and then exactly. what, what could be improved. That, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I love that you say that, you know, to start with, okay, here's a positive and this is what, you know, uh, you know, this works. So it's not all about, you know, I'm take, I'm tearing it down and this looks horrible. And so being sensitive to your classmate and, you know, and then offering the advice or, uh, you know, and, and again, we, we all see things differently. So not to say that, hey, just because I see it differently, it's completely wrong. And this is why, you know, and so making that space creating that, that of space for people to then talk about and be sensitive to others. Um, and sometimes uh, I will, I will uh, say, if, if this is a, 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 a new space for you, then I will do an example of it with the first hmm. person um, so that they, and I think what, what, I, what I said the last time was that um, uh, I think it's very true that um, kindness is so underrated. And that mm -hmm. the, the least or the, the, the best that we can be is least kind to one another and how we say it so that you're not there to deflate someone else. We're here to prop someone else and get you to the next level. Obviously, you walked in communicating. <laughs> so now let's right. perfect those skills just to the next level. For you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I tell them because it was a valuable lesson for me when I was a college student, but I'm a college student forever. But anyway, in the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I remember one teacher saying how, how really you're going to be wanting criticism. Uh, it's so important uh, uh -huh. and people shy away from it. They always want to just say, oh, how great everything is. But you really don't learn from that. And uh, I, and I was pretty young in my college career, in my early 20s. And I, I really started to understand how please tell me the truth uh, so I can actually grow. And of course, I do what you guys were saying. I, I, I tell them how to critique with kindness, but I try to emphasize how important it is for a real critique because right. you're not, you need to get better and your classmates often are really great because they can really show you that uh, and it's nice to, first you learn how to uh, give a good critique and that that is a skill that takes time to learn and that's where the teacher mm -hmm. provides examples and so on um but the, to understand the value of a critique but you don't want to hear how great everything is and how great everything right. is it, right. it you really won't learn so in my first semester design course once you really say it enough they really understand and sometimes i have to point out well i think that like if it's a figure that the proportion could be a little bit more fashionized however there's many ways to do fashion proportion 
but what do you think? How right. could we improve on that? And they're very open. They go, yeah, you know, I think I could do that. And then the, the other right. students come in. Uh, yeah. Just a, a criticism is really a learning tool, and that we right. emphasize yeah. that. You right. really right. do right. not. I love to make a difference. Value. I'm so sorry. Huh? Uh, um, yeah, it has, the yeah, the it's word, criticism critique. that makes the difference. Yeah, uh, positively. And critical. You know, right. But this, I've never had a student say anything horrible to another student ever. I'll be honest. Right. Oh, may, okay. I say, may I say something? Hi, Jose. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Jose. This is Eleanor. Hey, Eleanor. Thank you for joining us. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I just wanted to um, just piggyback on what was just said about. Um, <clears throat> You know, when using the peer assessment, I, I agree with you that um, students are tend to say, oh, they did it fine, they did it fine, you know, <laughs> because they don't really, <laughs> they really don't, they don't really understand or, you know, they, part of it is they don't understand. Second, they don't want to, you know, they probably don't want to embarrass anybody. So they say, oh, it's great, it's great. But I, what I've done is I, I've, you know, I teach dance, I teach movement, and what I try and do is, uh, focus on you know proper form right and uh, and show the contrast well this is how we do it you know this is proper form this is not this is doing it with without proper form um, right. so that's right. one technique I use um, but so that that's that's a good 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 thing to put in a in a rubric I think the rubric is really important to, to have a rubric but I also um, want to um, just reinforce what was said about improvement, you know, mm -hmm. that we can always, even if you have proper form, you can still improve. You can still improve right. the movement. And so that I think is very, very key. And it goes into critical thinking and, and having students, you know, describe in their own words what they're seeing instead of just saying, okay, you know, it looks good. <laughs> she did it great, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, right. so the rubric I think is very important, and and the idea of how can we improve? How can we improve? Because right. there's so many right. ways of doing doing the movement. How can we improve? Yeah. Right. Right. This is great, valuable uh, feedback. You know, from all, everyone sharing their ideas and thoughts. And uh, you know, again, it always goes back to the teacher. You know, here is. You know, here are some examples. Here's the rubric. Here, you know, leading that way so students, you know, you might have students who have never done peer assessment, have no idea how to critique, and then you might have some who do. And so, just leveling that playing field is so crucial uh, for the students. Yeah. Um, let me move on to number. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead. So someone else wants to say something? Oh, I, I, I am uh, to piggyback on, on Eleanor. Hi, Eleanor. Um, I uh, <laughs> I also use it at the end, and uh, in class I will take those blue book. Um, 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 uh, test books, and mm -hmm. I will put a person's name. I, I do calligraphy, so I'll do it in calligraphy, so it looks really great. Here's this person's, and mm -hmm. everybody gets a page uh, to write how they improved. So it's, mm -hmm. a, a, it's I call it a rainy day note, so that yeah. when you're out in, in the business world, uh, and there's going to be days when you don't think you can do this, you don't think you can do that. Um, you're going to look at each of these notes. Now you could say that somebody said that just to be nice. However, uh, they could have chose many different things to be nice about. So I still see, think that there is some truth in what they write. You know? Oh, I, I love that you mentioned that, Patricia. And we refer to that as reflection, right? Reflection notes. Uh, you know, and having yeah. students do the oh, right. reflection. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I love, I love it. I love. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. You know, reflection is so key. Uh, having students, and that was part of the uh, graphic over here that I was using. Uh, here we go. Right, the goal. Students check their understanding and extend their learning, and reflection is a key a key part of that. Uh, and, and 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 making it a habit, just like how you do in your in your class, having students uh, keep a journal or have them write about what they learn or learn from their feedback or in critique that they've gotten from everybody else. I love that. One one student really was was crazy at it. She was uh, very creative. Um, we use index cards to speak from, and uh, so she bought index cards that were different colors, and she found the. Uh, the color for each person in the room that they liked. So on one side was their favorite color, and on the other side she had written prior 
to us even getting into the classroom because I said that's what we were going to be doing. Um, a little note for each person. So oh, that's another great. Really? Yeah, great yeah. Yeah. Above yeah. Yeah, these are, these are some great, great advice. I'm, I'm so happy we're recording this for those who can't couldn't make it. Uh, I'm going to move on to number four because I'm running a little behind. But number four is one of one of my favorites. It's called the goldfish technique. Uh, just like a goldfish is in a you know goldfish bowl. So if you if you visualize a goldfish bowl, and you're looking at a goldfish bowl from the outside in, and so you have you have uh, what you do is you have your students again do their on your own time activity, you know, work uh, at home, you know, watch the video and whatever assignments are attached to that video. And then when they come back into the classroom, you can do the goldfish technique. And basically what the goldfish technique is about, it helps you, and again, this goes back to your student profiles, right? As long as you, the better you know your students, the better these activities uh, will work for you. And so what you, what the, what the idea of the goldfish technique is you might have some students, you know, you might have a split in students who are shy and quiet, and then you might have those who are the ones that are always the same students raising their hands. And then you might have those that are the leaders and then the followers. Uh, you might have those that are the, the, the uh, setting that pace as moving forward for you as, as, as you're teaching in the classroom. Those are the students that are asking the questions and jumping ahead of the topic. And then those who are still trying to digest what you just said, right? So you have a mix of students in your class. And this is where your student profile, you start jotting these notes as you know who is who. So that when you do the go fish technique, you know who, who to put in the inner circle and who to put in the outer circle. And so when you come to the physical classroom, you're gonna have, again, depending on how your classroom setup is, if, you're, if you have the space to do an inner circle, move the tables into a small circle in the middle, and then do a large table, a circle around the middle circle, if you could do that. If not, you can have students stand around the inner circle as they observe the inner circle. And so the way it works is that the students who are inside the circle, the inner circle, are the only ones who uh, those are the only students who are allowed to speak oh, okay. those, those who are in the inner circle are the only students who are allowed to speak the students who are in the outer circle are not allowed to speak they're just there to observe and the beauty of the fishbowl the goldfish technique is that <clears throat> it's, it's often difficult for us to um, separate ourselves from our mistakes because we're too close to them, <clears throat> right? So if I have an opinion about a topic and I'm arguing with other students and I'm, I might be wrong about it, it's hard for me to see that I'm wrong because I'm so attached to the topic. And if you take that person and you put that person in the outer circle and then you have somebody who's in the inner circle with similar thoughts and ideas that relate to that person, the person in the outer circle, the person in the outer circle is most likely to see the flaw in the conversation because they have separated themselves from the issue. And so that's what you're trying to do with the goldfish technique. You're having these students who are probably always the ones to raise their hand, jump the gun, talk before, any, before thinking, put those students in the outer circle you might want to put some students who are quiet and shy or uh, are not usually open to, a, to their opinions in the inner circle, and you'll see the dynamic work out. Now, like I mentioned earlier, you can modify the game. You change it to how you like. You can make these uh, activities uh, to, your, uh, you know, to, uh, to, your, to your observation of your class and students. Um, any ideas and thoughts about the goldfish technique? <coughs> and one other thing I forgot to mention is that the goldfish technique also encourages observation. It encourages students to stop and listen and to observe. Okay. And so you therefore you're helping them build listening skills. Um, any ideas on the goldfish technique? 
Yes, I have. Uh, I have some comments on that. I, I have not used that um, with my students. I've used it in uh, training adults, you know, in the workplace. Uh -huh. um, but I think I think it's a very very valuable um, um, exercise. Um, I I would say like with students, college students that, um, or with any actually any group, the directions have to be very clear, almost like what we were talking about before with the rubric. Because right. the observers need to know what they what they're observing. The the, right. the people in the inner circle have to know what you know what's expected, especially hmm. those who are like you said, who are shy, who are the students who don't really initiate. I mean, those who are the leaders probably would take the ball and run, but the instructions for the inner circle would have to be clear, just like a rubric would be clear. Right. And then you know, with all that set up, I think. I think it's very good. I think it's excellent. Fishbowl technique. Yeah, that's a, that's a great that's a great point you make, Eleanor. Is is again when you uh, scaffold these activities, just make sure that the instructions are clear and everyone knows exactly what to do. Because sometimes if you put all the talking talkative students in the outer circle, <coughs> you might have um, difficulty sparking the conversation if all the students that are in the inner circle are not willing to talk. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. But I think okay. you're saying that, that gives them, <clears throat> even the more reticent ones, um, a, a chance to shine. Exactly. And again, you're offering those opportunities, right? You're offering these opportunities for those who otherwise would never. Yeah, I, I totally. Um, the last thing I'm going to, the last topic that I'm going to add uh, to the list is gamification. Oh, sorry. Oh, here's my image of going back to what I what I mentioned earlier about this is a, an image I, I meant to show it while I was talking about the um, uh, Japanese uh, kint sugi technique, where in, in the West, if some you know we have a plate or or, or or bowl that falls and breaks, we don't bother with fixing it. We just hey, let me toss in the garbage and buy a new one. In Japanese culture, this is a an art form. Is the beauty behind the cracks. And these students, and, and seeing that beauty, seeing the truth and beauty in your students, as you know, as teachers, that's what we do. We we seek the truth and beauty, not only in the subject matter and what we do, but also in our students. And so, uh, you know, being um, prideful about our mistakes and things we've done in our past, and our and our and, our, and, and putting that past and allowing that space for students to shine about their past in. Uh, and some of these activities and seeing it in the student proof in your student profiles is a, is a great way uh, to then uh, make some of these activities much more fun and interactive. Um, uh, one quick thing I did forget to mention is our interactive videos. There are ways for you as you're flipping your classroom, uh, as your students are watching these videos, there, there, there are tools out there that allow you to add questions in your videos and make your videos much more interactive. If you are interested in that, you can always come and speak to me or Jeffrey or you know any, any one of us, and we can show you some tools that are free on the internet that you can you know like one of them is um, oh, I'm blanking right now. Uh, Playposit. Playposit is one uh, tool that you can uh, as you're flipping the classroom to make your videos much more interactive. As students are watching the video on their own time. <coughs> You, know, you can you can you can prompt them with questions and key points on the key takeaways of your video. Um, and the last thing I'm going to mention, the last number five was gamification, right? Um, you can also create games. Uh, I've done a couple with faculty here at FIT. Here are some examples of some ways that you can gamify your course. Um, this is Professor Lorenza Wong, and we created a, an escape room using Google Forms and Google Slides where students had to, she teaches about swatches, right? And so students have to learn about the swatches. These are freshman students and they're learning about swatches for the first time. <clears throat> and so we, we created a storyline. Uh, there's a, a thief at FIT who is stealing swatches and we called it the FIT textile caper. And it was a tremendous uh, success. Uh, students were having fun. We did this during the remote teaching uh, and it was a lot of fun. I participated in that. 
And this is an, a bitmoji of Professor Lorenzo Wong. The students really had a lot of fun playing this game. It took us some time to build, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, but you can see here, here's the swatches, and students had to figure out. And every time they answer a question correctly, then they were offered a clue to who is the thief. Uh, another game that we created was a Lady Gaga game. We called it the Lady Gaga uh, Fashion Tour or World Tour, where students were in a students were put into groups, and they were competing for a uh, a position as uh, Lady Gaga's fashion stylist. And the team who collected all the six garments and had the highest score uh, won and became her fashion stylist for her tour. Uh, and this was a lot of fun to build. We did this in um, also in um, uh, Google Forms, and we did we used Google Slides. And the, la the last game that we just built, I built this recently uh, for Professor Lorenzo Wong, is also a discussion game where it encourages students to discuss. It's built around, I don't know if you're aware of the, um, yeah. there's a, uh, uh, it's basically, um, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but it's based off a game, uh, a popular game on the internet where students are grouped together and they're supposed to solve uh, these missions and tasks. And so here's the map of all the tasks that they have to complete. But among the students, among the group, there are three sabotagers who are trying to get them to fail this mission. And these are the 12 tasks they got to go through. So, the, you know, they'll go to task one and, you know, here are some problems they had to solve. You know, these are math problems. And then if they, if they get it right, they move on to task number two and they go back into the map. But then at, at, at the end of every task, they have to figure out who is trying to sabotage our mission, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and that person, you have to vote out who they think is a sabotager. So, you know, these are some ways that you can gamify your class. If you're not into that and you're not, you're not, you know, you're not, you're not looking to build your own game, you can always refer to Kahoot. Kahoot is a free uh, tool that's on the internet that um, allows you to create like trivia-like games. Uh, it's built for you. All you have to do is insert your questions and then have your students in the classroom you know, it's like a, a, a become a millionaire type of trivia or, or monopoly type of games where students have trivia. And then um, it's a fun way to, uh, as they come back from the on your own time, to test them um, what they learn uh, while they were uh, watching your videos and doing the homework on your own time. So those are my five uh, activities that I wanted to share with everyone. I, I know I went a little bit beyond our 12 o'clock. But if anybody else has any ideas or suggestions or questions, now is the time if you want to share with everyone. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Jose, for, uh, for the session. It was really good. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, thank you. There's a lot of good feedback. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Um, again, this will be recorded. I will send a, a link. Uh, with, to everyone who participated. Also, uh, here's a little plug. Uh, be, be sure to check our um, uh, remote learning uh, website. We have all, all of our workshops, upcoming workshops there. You feel free to, uh, uh, to check that out. Our next workshop we're going to be doing, um, one of my favorite is digital storytelling. How can we get our students, instead of having you know to write a paper, how can we push uh, this writing assignment to having students actually create a video, you know, like a, a video presentation or documentary style uh, video and then hand it over to you um, as, a submit, as a submission, right, for an assignment, having students create their own videos. And it's a fun way to get students to uh, create their own media. And um, so that's the next workshop. Um, and um, I will follow up with an email with a uh, survey. Please feel free to complete the survey. Let us know what you think about the workshops and how we're conducting them. It always um, helps us to make better workshops for you all. And also be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel because most of the videos are going to be in there. Uh, if you, and also in the website that Tammy mentioned in our remote teaching website. All the videos will be there for you to, to, to go back and look at. Um, so, oh, yeah, I think. Great.
Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Eleanor, uh, and, and everyone else who asked these amazing questions and also participate and share some ideas. It's always fun to hear from everyone else. I don't want to be the only one talking. Jose? See you next yes. time. Jose, yes, Peter? Go ahead, Peter. Um, about accountability. So in the past, I've posted videos, and they were in YouTube, so they were placed in Blackboard. And um, buy-in was not as high as I'd like, like 60% or something. And I was wondering if there's anything in Blackboard that would help to get them to, to, to be certain that they watched the videos. And they, they were short, anywhere from three to seven minutes, um, instructional videos for specific things in software. And I don't know, does Blackboard have anything that you can automatically send readers or anything to encourage them to, to view that before the class, um, you know, other than me pestering them? <laughs> yes, actually, we do have some tools available uh, for faculty to, uh, if you're looking to see the numbers as, as to who watched, if you're looking for concrete data as to who watched the video from beginning to end, there are several ways you can do that. Uh, one tool is if you are using VoiceThread, VoiceThread can do that for you. If you set the rule that tells you, okay, um, you know, you have to watch the video and VoiceThread will tell you who watched the video from beginning to end. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is uh, one of the tools I mentioned today, PlayPosit. PlayPosit will also uh, will track uh, the student from beginning to end and will let you know. Now, again, it's a free tool, so it is limited in some ways. But PlayPosit would also do that for you. Uh, another way is, and this is a now this is a little tricky or a, a nice strategic way to figure out is to. Uh, at the end of the at the end of the video, you have uh, a code or a question or something that only those students that will make it till the end. Uh, and then in play positive, what you can do is uh, you can prevent students from fast forwarding, right? And so what you do is only those students who reach the end will have that code that then you or the question or something that will generate for you that this person watched it, right? So that's another way you can do it. Uh, uh, so th those, those are some ways I, uh, you can do it. And again, the other way is the old fashioned way as teachers, you know, uh, when they come into the classroom, who's adding that, who's adding value to the conversation? Who are those people that you know, really know what they're talking about? Uh, and that's the old fashioned way, right? As a teacher trying to figure out as you're in the classroom and, and, and asking questions and who's participating, who's adding. I always say this, and I, I love it because I always say to teachers, hey, why not put that in your syllabus? You know, as you're saying, uh, if you don't add value to the conversation when we're talking in the classroom, your grade is heavily affected by your performance, right? And so that right away, you're saying, you're earning the grade, I'm not giving you a grade, right? You never say, I'm giving you a grade. No, you're earning the grade that, by demonstrating to me that you know what, you know, you know what you're talking about. And, you know, so those, those are the old fashioned ways. But again, with technology, you can always fall back to VoiceThread or PlayPosit. Let me type that into the chat room. Uh, PlayPosit is a free tool. I mean, they do have the paid version, uh, uh, but we don't have that tool. Uh, but it's, the, the free version the, does pretty well. The video play through PlayPosit. So where does the video reside? You made a yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, um, that's a great question. Yeah. The, the the videos can be pulled in from YouTube, or or you can upload them directly to PlayPosit. I might be incorrect about that, but I know you can bring them in through YouTube. I'm I'm not sure if you can upload them to PlayPosit with the free account, because I usually what I do is I usually put my videos on YouTube and then link them that way through PlayPosit and then add my questions. Um, into those videos and, and, and it's also important to know where to place those questions before you move on to the next topic right so if i have a question about what we just covered you want to make sure that question is placed properly in the video before you move on to the next topic and so you're you know you're, you're prompting the students uh, 
the question before you move on to the whatever else you're going to talk about. And it helps them remember. Um, and also helps them understand that when the midterm and the test comes up, this was a key takeaway, which was, was mentioned during my lecture, as you would do normally in a face-to-face in a, in a -face classroom. It's a Thank great you. question, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, it, it's 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 it, it's a lot also to, a lot that we covered in our video maker series. I don't know if you attended, Peter, but we had we, while we were doing the video maker series, we covered a lot about, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, how long are the videos going to be? Uh, you don't want to put too much content. You want to make these videos. You want to chunk the videos so that they are uh, easily digested, you know, by your students. Um, and, and the research shows that video students love videos because they can always slow down, rewind, pause. Uh, for students who are not English speaking uh, students, uh, first language English speakers, they can always put the captions on. Um, uh, you know, so, so studies do show that videos, and again, going back to the flipped classroom approach, video students. Um, Really appreciate the actual work that faculty will do when they do when they create these videos for them, you know. Uh, um, uh, so, just like when I was in school, I remember I would bring my recorder and <laughs> ask permission for the professor. Can I can I record, you know? And then I'll go home and then make time to review and listen again because I it's it's too much to, up you know, to just soak it all in at one sitting. Yeah. So yeah. All right. Well, um, uh, if there are any more questions or comments, then I, I hope to see you all in our next workshop. I think I'm forgetting the date. What is it? Uh, let me go back. Our next workshop on digital storytelling will be on, if I can find the schedule real quick, I'll tell you all. August three and five, I think. Yes. Yes, that was that's right. August three and August, uh, yes, August third and August fifth at eleven a.m. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah it's going to be fun. It's it's getting your students to actually become movie makers and and make their own movies and and submitting them to you, and uh, yeah, tell the stories. And so far, it's been working great at FIT. I've been using it now for the past two years at FIT, and it's I used to use it at Columbia, but back then it was much harder because I had to take a two-hour session teaching everybody how to use iMovie, and iMovie is not, it might not be straightforward as Adobe Spark, and so that's why I brought that back. Now that it's so easy for students to make their own videos with the technology that's now out there, Adobe Spark yeah. makes it very easy for students to, to make their own uh, stories uh, come to life. Oh, I'm excited. Uh, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you all for joining. I think it was. Um, a lot of fun listening to all your ideas. Thanks for staying some, over. Some great <laughs> Thanks for oh, yeah. staying over. You always do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Go have some lunch. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to want to have some lunch, Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all the insight, all the insightful. Uh, oh, no. Uh, I, great I ideas. learned so much. A lot of extra yeah. that I didn't. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. I and feel Patricia. like I'm behind the time. The game oh. thing? Oh, my God. That is cool. Which, which, I'm sorry, which the one? Game, the game. Oh, the game. That, yeah, the game. Oh, game. my God. That oh, yeah, is. Yeah. That, yeah, that has yeah. a bit of a learning curve. Oh, let me let you know. We'll talk about it next time. All right. All right. <laughs> it's only to pick and to me. It's 12 15. I feel guilty. I feel guilty. <laughs> and Patricia, thank Take you care. again for all your feedback. You too, Joanne. Take all care. Right. And, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okie doke. All right. So, ciao bello. <laughs> ciao, ciao. <laughs> Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.